So this lecture covers anion gap, and anion gap is essentially just going to be a calculated measure that tells us when there's excess acids in the body. So these two columns, I'm going to illustrate a little bit what the two columns represent, and I'm going to start with the column on the left, which represents plasma cations, which are essentially positive electrolytes. And the plasma cations that we're talking about specifically are potassium and sodium. And of course, sodium is very, very abundant in the body. So we also have something called unmeasured cations, and we're just going to call that UC. We're going to put a positive, and we're going to ignore that for now. And of course, this in the body has to equal, our positives have to equal our negatives. And our negatives are our anions, so these are equal to one another. And of course, our anions in the body are chloride and hydrogen, excuse me, and bicarbonate, or HCO3. And we also have what are called unmeasured anions. And this is kind of the whole key, unmeasured anions. This is our anion gap. And so you can see that our unmeasured anions are actually greater than our unmeasured cations. And this has some implications within the body. And it's not that unmeasured cations and unmeasured anions are abnormal, it's just that there's many positive things in the body that positively charge that aren't actually within what is going to be our anion gap calculation. And there's a number of unmeasured anions that are in the body that aren't calculated either. And in a review of acid-base chemistry lecture that I'll give separately, I'll tell you kind of why why these anions are called what they're called. But for now, I'm just going to tell you that we calculate anion gap this way. And so anion gap equals, and this is usually done automatically on our chemistry analyzer. It's going to be our positives, so sodium and potassium. You're going to add those, and you're going to subtract bicarbonate, which, of course, on our chemistry analyzer is also TCO2, and you're going to add bicarbonate to chloride and subtract that from that addition. And so this anion gap, which is essentially this unmeasured anions, has a value normally. So you normally have some anion gap. So when we look, what we actually look for is we look for an increase in anion gap. And an increase in anion gap essentially tells us that we have an increase in acids, even though it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. So this increase in anion gap tells us that there's an increase in acids in the body, and we can interpret this to tell us that there is a titrational metabolic where we can have respiratory and metabolic acidosis. And these terms will make a little bit more sense as we go on. And this increase in anion gap, which I've mentioned before, is due to something called CLU. And so one of the reasons it's actually called a titrational metabolic acidosis in the body is because it can actually use up bicarbonate, because of course bicarbonate is our main buffer, and it uses up bicarbonate because the bicarbonate's used to titrate away these excess acids. So let's talk a little bit about what CLU is. So what CLU is, so the K stands for ketones, and we look for this by looking for ketones in the urine. And we see this most commonly, well, we don't see it commonly, but when we see it, we see it in animals that have diabetic ketoacidosis. So these look like they have diabetes, so they'll have an increase in glucose, and usually glucose in the urine. And it's due to, of course, altered carbohydrate metabolism. And so how you identify it is going to be ketones in the urine, less common. So that's K for ketones. You can also see it in animals just with a negative energy balance. So L, lactate, is more common. And how did you identify this? Well, you could actually measure lactate on um, 
a blood gas analyzer, so you can measure lactate. But you can, that's a terrible lactate, let's try that again. So you can presume, or assume, that you may have an increased lactate in certain cases, especially when you're dehydrated, especially severely dehydrated, uh, which could lead to decreased perfusion. And that's similar for hypovolemia, so animals that are very hypovolemic. Let's try that again. And why I say hypovolemic, of course, because you can have an animal with acute blood loss who's not necessarily dehydrated. And also an animal who is has a very severe anemia, so a very decreased PCV. And this is a severe anemia that's actually impacting blood, um, excuse, excuse me, tissue perfusion for the hypovolemia and the dehydration. And for anemia, you're having potentially anaerobic metabolism because of a lack of oxygen. And so in an animal that has an increased anion gap, and you don't have other explanations, but if they're dehydrated, hypovolemic, or anemic, it could be that. So U is uremic acids. And so you're essentially going to look for azotemia. So an animal that's azotemic, this could be any cause of azotemia. And E is ethylene glycol, which I'm going to abbreviate EG. And we'll talk more about this um, in class some, but a classic kind of thing that tells us that there's ethylene glycol is an animal that's an acute renal failure, they have acute kidney injury, a classic urine finding or calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals, so they have calcium oxalate monohydrate, and these animals with ethylene glycol, you'll learn about this in toxicology, often present first for maybe they've they become ataxic, they might drink a lot of water, um, and it's, if you treat them then they can do okay, but if you wait and you don't treat them, certainly they will go into aneuric or oliguric renal failure. And what happens is their tissues essentially form or become mineralized due to deposition um, of various calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals. And these animals often have a low calcium along with being profoundly azotemic um, hyperkalemic, etc. So calcium oxalate monohydrates, as opposed to dihydrates, they look like a picket fence or a stake. And I always remember this. That um, that's not super great. That one. Let's try it again. But if your idea of death is suburbia, then think picket fence. If you're scared of vampires, think stake in the heart. And that's one way to remember it. So let me just show you one thing here. So in an animal that has an increase in anion gap, so they have this excess acids in the body, which increases this calculation for the anion gap, what happens is, so this part, because this doesn't get bigger, right? That does not happen. So this anion gap part grows. So that's all it's growing, and it's kind of growing into the bicarb part, and it's not so much that it's growing into the bicarb part, it's that this is being used up to titrate away the acids. So of course that means that with a titrational metabolic acidosis, or with this increase in anion gap, what we expect is we expect to see a decrease in our TCO2, which of course is also our bicarbonate. We will talk more about this when we talk about specifically bicarbonate. So of course the other thing to realize about ethylene glycol is that since it causes acute renal failure, acute kidney injury, and often anuria, you're going to see azotemia. So in this case you could have uremic acids and ethylene glycol, both of those contributing to the anion gap. And at that point it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, of course also since you have anuric renal failure oftentimes, you can see an increase in potassium, which could also be due to the acidosis, right? So you can get a shifting. Because of the acidosis that we're seeing, of course, that can cause a shift of potassium 
out of the cell, hydrogen ion into the cell. So there's multiple things occurring in these cases. 